this week on the Back Table Podcast. Knowing where to safely cut the skin is the battle. And that battle can take hours because you don't want to lose your anterior blood supply. That's the most robust blood supply, which comes from that superficial temporal artery. But your remnants from that microtic ear is what makes the ear ugly, which I call the nubbin. The more nubbins you have, the uglier the ear is. And so I have thought a lot about this when I look at our previous dehiscences and our previous wins and losses. And what I've learned is it's better to delay removal of nubbins for safety of the flap and then deal with it at the next surgery. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with the hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. My name is Gopi Shaw. I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist, and I have an awesome guest and a great episode for us today. I have Dr. Maiti Trong. She is a clinical associate professor and pediatric otolaryngologist practicing at Stanford Children's in California where she's the clinical chief and the fellowship director for pediatric otolaryngology. I had the awesome opportunity to get to work with my T on the fellowship committee for ASPO, the American Society of Pediatric Otolaryngology. And so I feel super, super excited. It's my great pleasure to have her here today to talk about something she's so passionate about, which is microtious surgery in children. And we're going to focus on surgical tips and tricks. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Mighty. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad that we finally got to do this. Absolutely. I know. <laughs> yeah. Before we get into it, I do want to tell you thank you. In Paris, I've been able to uh, get to know Dr. Charlotte Salarier from Nicar Children's. So quick shout out to Charlotte. So thank you for that introduction. <laughs> Hi, Charlotte. I, I wish I could round with you guys at Nicar. <laughs> so fun. It's a great hospital. So before we get into my crochet, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your practice? So I practice at Stanford Children's, and I went to undergrad at UCLA, and I went to medical school at UC Irvine, and I did my residency at Stanford. I did my general surgery internship and my otolaryngology residency there, and I also did my pediatric otolaryngology fellowship. It's there that I fell in love with my crochet surgery with my attending at that time and now my colleague, Dr. Kay Chang. And... After being in practice for a bit, we had a chance to train in Paris with Dr. Francois Fermin to learn her technique for my crochet. So that's a little bit about my training. That's amazing. So in fellowship at Stanford, uh, you got really good my crochet training there, and then you were able to do even more training in Paris. Yeah. So the history of it is actually quite typical for an American my crochet surgeon which is that Kay Chang was trained in the Burt Brent technique, which is three stages or three surgeries to complete a microtia. And a lot of the world was switching over to two-stage techniques. So when I joined him, he was really ready to switch to a two-stage technique for the advantages that it has. And we had the opportunity to visit Dr. Fermin and have like a chance to see what it was like and then realize that I needed to spend more time with her to, to really learn it. Before we get into the surgical techniques, when do you usually meet these families? Do you ever have any prenatal visits or do you meet them in their first six months of life? When is your first meeting with some of these kids? That's a great question. I would say the majority of families don't get the prenatal diagnosis. Um, and that's because if you look at an ultrasound, you know, the way the ear is shaped, it's very hard to catch the ear in a single plane. And so a microtia ear, unless there's an anosia, and even then, it's just too hard to see. I think if you get a 3D ultrasound, maybe you'll catch it, but most families don't know. So usually it's like a surprise at delivery. And my heart goes out to these parents and especially the moms. You know, it's like the surprise that you weren't expecting. So we like to consult, you know, when they're born. And that initial consultation is in the hospital or if they're born at another hospital, after their newborn hearing screening, I'll, I'll see them in, in their infancy. Okay. And then um, when you meet the family, I find that that first conversation can be really difficult in terms of explaining everything that's sort of going on and the trajectory of it. What, what is your conversation like? Well, first, 
you know, I really wanted to design it well. So the first thing is these patients get extra long visits. It's not my standard new patient visit. And we double team it, Dr. K. Chang and I. We're a two surgeon team. We're like mom and dad in the OR. And in, in like consultation, we're a really good balance. We sit down with the parents. I really like to get a feel on emotionally where they are, because if they're just not there, then our first visit is just to hold their hands and, and really remind them that their kid is going to grow up and be awesome no matter what they choose. But we purposefully divide the conversation into hearing topics and then ear reconstructive topics. And we ask the parents, like, where, where would you like to go with this conversation? Yeah. And so how do you usually follow them? What's your follow-up plan until you start considering surgery? We see them initially as a newborn until a hearing status is decided. Like if it's very straightforward, we fit them with a, a hearing device, which is called a Baja and a soft band. And as soon as that's ready, then we see them once a year. And when you see them once a year, are you getting audios as well on your good ear? I find that initially when I first started practicing, sometimes I would be so focused on the microtic ear, but I... I would feel like, wait a second, like that good ear needs to be extra specially taken care of, meaning, you know, this is your ear where if we're starting to get ear infections or fluid or if there's any concerns in school and where the child should sit. Do y'all talk preferential seating and kind of talk to the families about some of that? Yep. I think every year our goal is like, are they wearing their hearing aid, their Baja soft band? And if not, are we doing an FM system at school? Are they getting the preferential seating? Um, how are they coping with it? We always like to talk to them about, you know, advances in hearing devices and hearing implants and, you know, the ear health of the other ear, any obvious like genetic syndromes that may be more apparent and other consults that may be needed. And then like a check in with the parents like, hey, how are you guys doing? You know, any speech delay or how are you, what are you guys thinking about surgery and all the surgical options? And for me, it's really important like whatever surgical option they choose, I want to help them coordinate the care, that it's very planned. Absolutely. And then on those check-ins, uh, the yearly check-ins, are you getting just an audiogram usually, like a behavioral audio? So um, I get an audiogram. And then like two things that we like to do is we like to measure their normal ear and measure their chest frame. Measuring their normal ear gets us a sense of when the ear stops growing. And after doing this for, for many years, it becomes very apparent there are growth spurts in the ear where we'll see them. We're like, your ear grew five millimeters. <laughs> and then, you know, when we're trying to decide, like, is this a good age to do surgery? Like, well, your other ear has stopped growing. So it's just nice to know. I feel like the textbook teachings about six to seven years old of when it's about 80%. Is that a good number? Or do you find with the measurements, there's a wider range or... It could be younger or much older even, or what have you found? I think that five to six is 80% is about right. But, you know, seven to nine, that growth is pretty stable. Seven to 10. So that's a, a preferable age. And when you take the chest measurements, where exactly are you placing the measuring tape? And I, I would imagine the chest would probably continue to still grow. Or is there a certain cutoff? Or what are you looking for in that measurement? So, you know, this is not perfect. And the idea is we're trying to see if the, the chest frame is robust enough for surgery. And so something that's very standard is at the xiphoid. You know, we take it at the xiphoid, we go all the way around. It's not a perfect measurement. If the child is like obese, it's not a good reflection of their chest frame, but it's something. And we have like a standard goal of 60 centimeters. We've learned that if there's 60 centimeters uh, circumference, then... In general, we'll have enough cartilage to make a, an entire ear. Okay. And then, sorry to jump back to the ear measurements. Are we doing length, width, like projection? Mm. Is it with it, one of those measuring tapes? Are you getting a protractor out? What's happening? This is awesome because it's weird. Okay, so if you look at an ear, no matter what, there's at one point the longest point, right? And so we just pick the longest point. And I have like this special caliper I got it from Dr. Fee, my old head neck attending. He called it the golden rule. It has a little clasper so it can pretty accurately measure the ear. So that's from bottom of the earlobe to the... Mm -hmm. To the very tippy top. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Wherever along the ear, it's longest. Okay, okay. Which we I call the ear access. 
ears have an access. Some some people have really turned ears and some people have ears that are like really straight up and down. Okay. That's also very good to know. All right. So let's get into the surgical like details because, you know, unless like you said, you've really have had a lot of training in micro crochet or that's, you know, what you plan to do. I would say most of us aren't going to be doing micro crochet surgery, but we do have to understand sort of how it works. And also, again, what is our screening process for the other ear, which we kind of were able to touch on. But I wanted to talk to you today about the surgery, given your expertise and experience. So let's say the child is seven years old. You feel that the growth in the chest is, it's the robust 60 plus centimeters. The ear, the last year or two is now, you know, has hit its maybe peak or, you know, that 80 to 90% of what we normally think. And we're talking about grade three microtia. We can focus on that, I think, first. For your preparation, are you using 3D printing? Is is that part of your preparation? Tell us how you start kind of planning your surgery. Okay, so the first thing is we get a CT scan for all kids. And that allows us to understand the temporal bone anatomy, make sure we, we know if they're a good candidate for ear canal reconstruction, make sure there's no cholesteatoma or anything happening behind the little ear, the underdeveloped ear that we can't see. That gives us information about the other ear. So I meet with a company that takes that really fine detail of the other ear. We make it into a mirror image and we have a what we call a planning session. We take it and we design each individual segment that I would actually carve during surgery, which is like the helix, the anti-helix, the tragus, anti-tragus complex, and then make an actual 3D printed model. The thing that's different about this than other people who say they use models is that it's high fidelity. Like our CT scans are, you know, 0.25 millimeter thickness, and it's printed in a sterilizable material. You know how some 3D prints are like kind of just globby? This is like really a perfect ear. And we've learned how to design it in a way that really matches the surgery, which means it actually has to be a little bit smaller than the regular ear to account for the skin envelope. And you have to design it in a way that's similar to how you carve it. So for every surgery, I have this ear that I'm holding in my hands to help me carve. And, you know, when you first start carving an ear, it's so complex, the three-dimensionality of it. And the traditional surgeon uses photos that are posted on the wall of the patient and then like a flat drawing on an x-ray film. And it's very hard to know the peaks and the troughs and like how things relate to each other. And so as an early carver, having this ear in my hands, I've really learned a lot about the relationship of each thing. And I just think anyone who's starting out doing my crochet surgery, I think they should have this 3D model. By the end, it's so funny because I, I showed Dr. Fermin my 3D model and I was just so proud of myself. I was like, look, Dr. Fermin, what we're doing now. And she looked at it and she was like, I don't need this. <laughs> I think she didn't, you know. <laughs> and then in terms of the Fermin technique, let's say, so you have your CT scan, your 3D model. And now, you know, the patients in the OR and are there measurements that you take or anything that you do before the prep and all that stuff? Are these measurements in the office, the OR? Let's get into that. So the weirdest thing about prep for this surgery, as opposed to other reconstructive surgeries that we do, is that we're trying to match something to the other side, which happens to be on the other side of the head, which is not always in like your field of view. And then there's all these things about the ear, like how tall it is, how front or back it is, and then how turned it is. And surgeons have tried many different ways to do this. And it's quite challenging. Some surgeons will leave the whole head prepped, like in view for the surgery, so that they can constantly refer back to the other ear. I worry constantly about sterility because, you know, the nose and the mouth and the eyes and the hair, like... We're putting a cartilage framework into a pocket. Like, I just don't want any risks of infection. And so this 3D modeling that I do, the amazing thing is I can work with a computer programmer and we can place it perfectly in place on a picture. And the way we do it is we use the actually skull landmarks. So we line up the orbits and line up all like the mastoid suture lines and actually the bony landmarks instead of like the soft tissue. And then we place the ear 
So before surgery, I have a picture of where the new ear should go relative to the my crochet ear. And so at the end, when I draw my drawings, I have this comparison. It's not perfect, but it's really nice to know like, hey, this looks very similar to my 3D planning. And that's really upped our game in terms of size and placement. So do you use that to help you decide where your incisions are made or in relation to what level of the eye you're putting it, the angle? Tell me exactly how the drawing and the details of that help you. How do you apply it, I guess, when you're operating? You know, you do some measurements from like the canthus to where the new ear should go, both the oral and the ocular canthus, okay? And then you take measurements relative to the nasal dorsum, and then you draw where your ear should go. And then to decide on your incision, you say, if this is where the new ear should go, how do I make the skin of the crush ear go there? And then, you know, decisions are made on incision. Wow. Okay. And so at this point, the patient is not prepped and draped. Your markings are sort of giving you an idea in the measuring. Patient's asleep. Your bed is 180, all that. But this is sort of the pre, like, marking everything out. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really do think the time spent for that stage is really, really important. And that 3D picture that I get from the company ahead of time, I actually do that, you know, in my mind. I have decided on the incision from that 3D modeling session. And so then you, you have the model with you in the OR and you can do your measurements, figure out sort of your landmarks, and then you can also sort of place the model and then kind of see how that then is, how you want to do your incisions based on that. That's very cool. Okay. And then are you tegaderming the eyes and then prepping everything out? Are you covering the mouth with your towels? I think these details are important. So the classic for mean approach is that once you do your drawings, the most important drawing on the face near the ear is the angle of the ear, the axis of the ear. So on the cheek, there's going to be an arrow that will guide you to which axis the ear should be placed once it's in its pocket. And so that drawing is left on the cheek near the ear and will be in the field. And I cover it with a tegaderm so that it doesn't get washed away with the surgery. And then I have my drawing of where the ear should go and I cover everything else up. Okay. So you're not using the contralateral ear at this point. You don't need to because you have your models and your measurements. Mm -hmm. And my drawings. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then this is a <laughs> silly question, but are you always doing ipsilateral ribs? Do you ever? Always. Okay. Always. And so in your field as well, are y'all harvesting rib first or making your ear? And you have a two surgeon team. So how, how do y'all get to kind of play together? Well, first, let me just clarify. Burt Brent's technique is opposite rib, okay? okay? And that is advantageous for two surgeon teams because you're not in each other's way. But Dr. Fermin liked the shape of having the rib from the same side because what happens is the, the curve of that cartilage is like perfect for the curve of the ear, the base plate of the ear. But that means that we're all on the same side, which is a little challenging. We started out... Um, a two surgeon team helping each other on the rib and then helping each other on the skin pocket. And that way, Dr. Chang and I learned the surgery well together, but that took a long time. <laughs> like that was a long surgery. And so now we're really efficient because one person harvests rib, the other does the skin pocket. We work at the same time. And then when the rib is done, the remaining skin pocket area is dealt with the part that couldn't get done because the surgeon was standing there. Okay. In terms of rib harvest, and it sounds like you and Dr. Chang kind of go back and forth of who's going to harvest rib and then who's going to do the skin pocket and then like the grafting, or do you all have the same person doing the rib every time and the same person doing the pocket every time? In the past, we took turns, but for efficiency's sake, we have now at this point in our partnership, which I call my work marriage. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Those are important. Yes. <laughs> um, right now, he's harvesting the rib and I'm doing the skin pocket. And I'm, I'm so obsessive about the skin pocket. He probably prefers it because then he doesn't have me like in his ear. <laughs> well, OK, so let's just quickly talk about the rib harvest and then we'll get into creating the framework because that's a very important part of the surgery, as is the rib. So you said uh, you normally do the ipsilateral side for the Fermin technique. Is the incision, you know, a couple of finger breaths below the nipple? Where's the incision usually? The incision is along the costal margin, 
So you have a costal margin and then two finger breaths above that margin. Now, many surgeons approach this differently. There's two things you need to be able to do. One is you have to be able to get very close to that xiphoid to release the cartilage up near the xiphoid, which is really challenging because you don't want a pneumothorax and it's quite tight up there. But you also have to be able to access the floater because the floating rib is the helical rim and it's so important for how the ear looks. So some surgeons like to put it right in the middle. Some like to favor near the xiphoid because that part is really challenging to get out. Some people like a four centimeter incision. We personally don't want to struggle. And so we decide on, you know, a five to seven centimeter incision. Yeah. At the end of the day, you have a scar there and it beats a pneumo and beats not having enough ribs. So that's right. That's right. Yeah. Would you say it's similar to harvesting rib for airway surgery? No. Okay. (laughs) Or rhinoplasty is very, very different. Because that you're identifying a single rib. It's very easy to go right subperichondrially, you know, underneath, which is really safe. You're never going to get a pneumo. Whereas this, you're really harvesting like this giant chunk of rib and you're releasing it at the bony cartilaginous junction at each rib. And so I would say there's nothing like it. In terms of when you're harvesting the rib and you're getting some of the muscle off of the rib, are you... Just using straight up bovi? Are you using cold insurance? Are you worried about the heat? What are some of the tricks you've learned in terms of rib harvesting? It's mostly bovi, although, you know, I just recently watched a bunch of surgeons, actually, Kathy C in the Seattle group. They, um, they do a lot more cold dissection. I really liked it. So I think either way, but I, you still have to use a bovi to get some of those muscles off, the intercostal muscles. And you were talking about distinguishing the bone and the cartilage, which to me always felt a little hard. Sometimes, you know, the junction. Yeah. Is it visually like pretty clear to you because you've seen so many or do you use a needle or how do you find that junction? I remember as a fellow being freaked out because I was like, I can't see the junction (laughs) and like really being scared. And yeah, using a needle and trying to, you know, differentiate the two. And now I really rely on cleaning the surface. You know, if there's a little blood around the area, just washing it away and wiping it with a wet four by four. And you can really clearly see like that light purplish blue of that junction. Okay. And if you do end up having to check it with a needle or when you do use it, what gauge do you usually use? Um, I think we use, I don't know, 25 gauge. Okay. So something small. Something small. Yeah. Boy, that I'd have to ask Kay. (laughs) We haven't done it in a while. And then in terms of Dr. Chang's instruments or your instruments for like a rib harvest. Do you have a special elevator that you like to use? Yes, we do. What do you like to use? You know, I knew you were going to ask the name of this instrument. It's um, (laughs) because we call it the bone scraper. The podcast is called Back Table, girl. We got to have something (laughs) relevant to the back table besides my chattering, (laughs) but you know. Okay, because it is the best instrument. And I was like, so happy to hear I I had just had a chance to operate with Kathy C, which is like one of my dream come trues. We were just at a medical mission in Cambodia. And we did my crochet surgery together. And I swear there was like a moment in the operating room where like the sun was shining on us both. (laughs) You know what I mean? As like, as we were holding an ear together. Um, (laughs) And she liked it, this instrument. It's, um, we call it the bone scraper. And the classic instrument is a doyen. This doyen is this lovely curled instrument that you can imagine curling under the rib and like pulling it up in a safe way. And it's like a thin mini version with just a little curve to it for like baby ribs. And I love using that instrument to do the first dissection under the rib in like a nice, you know, subperichondrial plane, maybe subperichondrial, but it's called the rib scraper. Okay. Yeah, that's (laughs) it. So when you um, dissect down on the rib, you take the muscle off uh, superiorly, inferiorly, you find your junction, and then you kind of start with the doyen or the the bone scraper and create a plane? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And then how do you know how far laterally you're going to go and, you know, where your cartilage and its cuts are going to be to take off? So we go as far as we can. A helical rim is best when it's 10 centimeters no matter what the ear is. Now, we don't always get 10 centimeters, but that's the goal. And so as far back as possible. 
Okay. And are you using just like a 15 blade? What do you what do you like to use in terms of when you take that ribbon? Is it are you doing an angled cut? Yes. So we like to have the rib scraper or the doyen under under the rib to protect. And we get a 10 blade or a malleable. A malleable is also quite lovely because you know you can kind of gently put it under and then cut onto the metal of the instrument. Okay. That makes sense. Beveled. Yeah. Beveled. Okay. And do you take a couple of like going a few millimeters at a time or do you feel like pretty confident and it's in one or two swipes and that cut is released? I think really the key is that I like to bovi above and below the rib. Okay. And that really takes care of the blood vessels. There's always some on both sides, the superior and inferior edge of the rib and really free those margins. And then as soon as you have that uh, malleable under, the cut is pretty easy. And then someone's lifting it up. And then let's say, you know, got the rib out. How do you check for a a pneumothorax or some sort of pleural injury? Do you usually do Valsalva? You know, tell me about that. This is good because it's such a huge excision. It's really important to me that it's not a single Valsalva. So we fill the cavity up with water and then we do a, a Valsalva. But if you just do a single Valsalva, then those little openings can actually just be a little tamponaded and you could miss it. And so I actually was just with a surgeon who uh, I like the way he said it. He's like, you got to burp, burp the wound. Wound. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. <laughs> I don't think I have explained that one. <laughs> yeah. Scott Bevins. He's like, you got to burp it. And I was like, OK, where he had the anesthesiologist, you know, breathe in and out. Ah, OK. So, and, you know, to let like little air yeah. bubbles out. And I really like that. Um, yeah. Instead of like we would just do it a couple times. Yeah. And that's a great way to find little little openings in the pleura. And if you do have a pleural defect, what do y'all do? So we repair it. And so the repair is with like a 4 vicral and a taper. And the biggest thing is to not be scared about it because small pleural um, openings are no big deal. And, you know, I learned that with Dr. Fermin because they used to freak me out. And she would say, I did this for you so you can see nothing to be scared of. <laughs> So it's really key. I like purse string closures of these small openings. I like to put a red robinel catheter to suction out the air as you're closing, because if you will get a chest x-ray, you will see the air. Otherwise, the, the small amount of air, but you have to decide what you want to do about the air that you see, if you're going to chase it or, or leave it. And then um, I like to cover it with a little bit of muscle. If there's a big defect, I'll do you know a purse string closure and then rotate a little bit of that muscle to cover it as as a second layer. So when you close that incision, uh, are you leaving a drain in on top of the muscle then? So now let's say you've repaired the pleural defect, you've used the, what did you call the catheter? The uh, the red robinel? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. You've closed over that and you, you slowly remove that as you've closed that to get as much air out. Yes. So it's kind of that one, two, three pull. So you connect the red robinel to suction and then you pull it out. And as you pull it out, you close the closure. Okay. And so you're not like leaving pen roses or anything like those types of drains in. So this is an interesting, okay. I just operated with a bunch of surgeons who leave no drains in their chest wounds and neither did Dr. Fermin. But at Stanford, we place something called an on-cue pump, which is like a little bulb that gives a constant drip of bupivacaine. Um, And we've learned that that really helps with the post-op pain. And so that's placed at the layer of the muscle. And it can be quite a bit of fluid. So at the other end of the wound in a different plane, we do leave a JP bulb just so that we can, you know, collect excess fluid. Okay. So, you know, in terms of the rib incision, seromas and those kinds of things aren't as common. No, because we, we put a JP in. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So now we've done the rib harvest. Let's talk about what you're doing at the back table and creating the framework. So you have this rib. I assume that's what you also use the 3D model that you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. I prepare all the surgeons in the room for the three phases of my my crochet surgery. That's like to mentally prepare them. So phase one is two teams harvesting the rib and preparing the skin pocket. And the preparation of the skin pocket is probably the most important for the outcome of the surgery. There's two main battles. You must make a nice framework because nothing is hidden under the auricular skin. That's a commandment from Dr. Fermin. She has 10 commandments. 
And it's so true. You can have a beautiful skin pocket, but if your framework at the end of the day is not harmonious or not nice, it will be evident. It may not be evident in the first post-op week, but in four months when the skin edema is all gone, then you'll see it. So skin pocket is important and it's all about planning your skin approach. That's done and then we go to the back table and then we, we have our 3D model and we use that model to then draw x-ray film to cut it out to kind of decide which piece of rib goes to what. So is it the same floating for the helix every time or do you kind of re-look at everything that you have in terms of the rib you have and then decide? You look at the rib that you have and, and then decide and there are some classic patterns. And one branch point is, is that floater big enough for a helical rim? Yes or no? Okay. On a smaller kid, like age seven, a lot of times the answer is no. And when it's not, at the harvest, we go for the next rib. So we actually harvest bigger rib. And that's decided like intra-op while the rib is being harvested, often. And you talked about the five microtia subunits, I think. You talked about the creating the helix. Can you go through those? And are you sort of creating those subunits separately first? Does it all kind of carve out as one piece? How does that work? No, I definitely draw each piece on the, all the ribs that's harvested and I plan it before any cut is made. That used to stress me out <laughs> because once you cut, like that's all the rib you get. And the most important for me is having a good base plate because that's like, you know, the ear itself. And then I think the anti-helix is the next important thing. And there's two worlds of thought. The anti-helix or the Y piece is either a single piece that you cut right in half and you split or a wide piece of rib that you cut out in between, okay? And I can look at a surgeon in their work or their ears and, I, and I'll know which, which they did. And of course, like what I'm looking at is probably not what anyone else is looking at, but deciding those, where those pieces come from is the next step and inking it out. And then after you've inked it out, and you feel good with um, the subunits you have. And I assume you kind of look at the model and, you know, mm -hmm. I, I just see myself yes. like walking in circles, like I hope, you know, second yeah. guessing myself. But um, yes. anyway, then what's your next step? Then what do you do? So the inking it out is actually quite a big deal. Are you just using one of those purple skin marking pens like that they have you on the back table for you? Or is there a special cartilage inking pen? So Dr. Fermin and Dr. Nagata use this amazing damping paper and they would dip it in ink, they would cut it out, and then they would literally stamp on the cartilage. It was like the most amazing thing. It was this beautiful stamp of the ear. That ink that they used is not FDA approved. <laughs> so we can't, we can't use it. So yeah, so I just use a purple marker. And you know, you end up going through quite a few markers because it doesn't last, but they're only $2. It's okay. Yeah. And then drawing it out. And there's like a little art to it because you have to dot around, but draw on the inside. It's all about proportions. And if you aren't aware of where you cut relative to the inside or the outside of your drawing, your proportions will be all wrong. You're talking about the width of the, the actual ink or the mark. Yeah. Yeah, because we're talking about millimeters at this point. So do you always do it the same way where, okay, I know that my outside is going to be bigger than my inside and my inside of the dot is more consistent with the framework and the model or? So I know that because I'm using a cutout piece of x-ray to draw onto the rib and then I'm dotting around it. So then I remove it and I draw on the inside of that line and then I'll cut on the line. What do you use to carve? What kind of blade do you like? I'm really particular. We always need to have an 11 blade, a 10 blade, a 15 blade, and a two, three, and four hole punch as well as some carving tools. The punches I learned are always sharp because they're disposable and they're amazing to carve out the scafa. Dr. Fermin has these lovely carvers to kind of, you know, scoop out those pieces. And what I learned over time is that there are these like really curved places that you're carving. And the best way to get those curves are with an 11 blade. Okay, because it's very sharp. So you're going to get through these really amazing curves with the 11 blade. But what you're going to realize is that it's very hard to get full thickness with an 11 blade. So you'll start the curve, but you won't be full thickness. 
And if you try to go back with the 11 blade, then you'll cut into your original curve. And so people are scared to use the 11 blade. So I always say in my carving sessions that you start with the 11 blade to get those beautiful curves, but you finish with the 15 because the 15 is small and then can follow the curves without recutting into it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. So you're not scraping or cutting into the piece that you actually need. You want to have it a clean through and through cut. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. I need to take one of these carving courses. Okay. What are you holding the cartilage with? What kind of force up? I would imagine you have in the other hand, or are you holding the cartilage, your own hands? Yeah. I have all these memories of watching Dr. Fermin carve because it's like an amazing thing to watch. And she would often cut herself every surgery because we were using needles and knives and changing gloves is just like, just have 30 sets of gloves. And I wouldn't say that I cut myself that often, but I'm like really big into haptics. I love how my fingers feel how the instruments feel. I really feel like feeling it is important. And are you using loops? Loops. Loops. Okay. And then what if you break it or it bends? What do you do? Um, I cry. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, what if something happens? Do you, how do you... <laughs> what do you do in those situations? Or like, let's say just I can imagine the cartilage in some places gets just getting too thin to manipulate, right? This is why carving is so stressful. And it's not like one of those things where you're like, hey, try it. You know what I mean? Like, you got to practice. Like, I practiced on foam. Foam because that's what Dr. Fermin chose. And I, I love it. It's very similar. And um, you just can't make that mistake. But I think that's why the helical rim is so stressful too. We spend a lot of time on the helical rim. Actually, you know, while one person is carving the base plate and the antihelix, like one person is doing the helical rim because it's like really thin, one wrong move and it will break. And that's probably the one part that everybody looks at, right? Mm -hmm. Like one of the the most visual part of the repair. Tell me about putting the parts together now. What kind of sutures do you use for that? Okay, so... um, (laughs) Okay, so there's two worlds to do this. Okay, one is with like monofilament sutures, clear sutures. The other is wire, steel wires, steel sutures. Nagata and Fermin are classically steel sutures. What O is that? 5-0, 5-0 steel. I personally believe in it. And originally we started with sutures, Dr. Chang and I, because we didn't have the steel. Like it's really hard to get unless you know how to get it. And I have two reasons. One is we use steel sutures on straight needles, and that allows you to pin the framework in place, okay, onto a block. And that really sets the shape. The other thing is when you're spinning a wire. I was so bad at it, but I remember spinning the wire. Remember spinning the wires? It wasn't always tight enough or it would like spin on itself. Mm -hmm. I was really bad at it. (laughs) Do you remember how there's like, there's a lot of tension in the wire and like, have you, did you have them like pre-tighten the wire? Did you remember that your scrub tech doing that? I don't remember that as well, but. There's something about wire that has like tension in it that there's more or less that you, you have a sense of. And there's something about how you can spin a wire and not actually place that much tension on these two pieces of cartilage. Whereas tying a knot down and keeping that tension so that the knot doesn't move in my mind, always places tension on that cartilage. And with cartilage ears, you always worry about resorption. And when there's resorption, you're trying to figure out why. And there was this brilliant study by a Chinese group that did consecutive microtia repairs with monofilament sutures and then with wires. They happen to use titanium wires, but titanium and steel, I think, are probably similar. And they showed that the wire had less resorption. And when I say, you know, consecutive, I mean like hundreds, like their practice is so robust and their study of of their outcomes was so robust also. So we use wires and we spin them. Okay. And you spin them and this might be a dumb question, but you use your needle driver to help you spin them. So you're spinning them with your hands. I don't remember, maybe like having something with my needle driver and kind of using that initially just to see how far down I wanted it to go. So it's a wire spinner, actually, okay, made okay. for wires. Yeah. And like you you have to, this, this natural grip that you spin. 
and then you see the loops and then you feel the tension in the wire as you spin it. Uh, okay. And then you can you use regular suture scissors or do you have to use a little wire cutter? Wire cutters. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. And like literally there's like this little pile of wires, you know, in yeah. the back table when you're done. And then after you've cut, do you have to like curl them down the edge? Yes. And how long is your tail? Two to three millimeters. Okay. Okay. And then you pipe just like a single bend or something so it doesn't stick out? Yeah. You know, we used to obsess about cutting a little edge with the wires. Like, honestly, the framework gets enveloped in a capsule. And as long as it's flush, it's been good. But it does have to be flush against the framework. And I always laugh when I when we're doing this wiring because it's kind of intimate <laughs> because like we're like both holding the ear, me and my co-surgeon, which is usually Dr. Chang, unless I'm in a, on a medical mission. And like, I'm not even thinking about it, but like, I'm actually holding their ear. <laughs> to make sure that it's stable, like you need all hands on deck, if you will. Yeah. So I'm like holding the framework and I'm holding their hands while I'm spinning because I'm just trying to get a sense. And like, I had someone tell me recently, like, oh, I was holding their hand and I was like, I was? <laughs> and what's the order of putting the subunits together? There is an order. Is there an What is it? Absolutely. Yeah, because I can imagine it's got to turn and twist a little bit, right? Like yeah. there's going to be a little rotation as... That's right. And if something is off, the ear is not harmonious. Okay. So you have a base plate and then it's always the anti-helix. Because that little Y, if it's pointing in the wrong direction, everything is off. So it's the base plate and then the anti-helix. And then after the anti-helix, it is the support, which Dr. Fermin calls the P1. And that is a support under the base plate, which then supports the root of the helix and the tragus. So it helps make the ear a complete circle. So it's base plate, anti-helix, P1, helical rim, tragus, anti-tragus. Okay. So now we've put our framework together, and I think I went a little bit out of order, but let's go back to the skin pocket, because it seems like, oh, you just make a little pocket, but there's obviously more to it. Tell me about the incision and in creating the skin pocket. I would say that there are multiple hard parts of my crochet, and this is one of them, because that skin pocket will be the home of the new framework and its vascular supply. So if you made little holes in it, if you bruised it, if you were rough on it, there's nothing like stretching that skin over something inert with no blood supply that will prove to you how delicate you were with that skin pocket. So I'm pretty militant about that skin pocket because I've learned the hard way. If you accidentally bovied it or bipolared it or scraped it or held it with your bishop, then after that stretch of the suction, then, you know, you'll have small dehiscences. So there's some principles on this skin pocket. Once you draw your ear where it should go and you look at the baby remnant, you have to decide, is that remnant going to give me a lobule? If it's a grade three, is that lobule or remnant in the perfect location that it can be transposed and rotated to be part of the lobule of the new ear? And if the answer is yes, then you try to decide where that incision is. And if the answer is no, then you're going to divide the ear and make a lobule out of your framework. And so it's going to be a little bit different every time, just depending on what you get. And um, in terms of the size of your pocket, do you ever worry that it's too big? I would imagine if it's too small, that's okay. You can always make it bigger. But is it ever an issue if the pocket is just too big? You, or is you there... actually have to dissect a pocket that is at least one centimeter beyond the line of the ear, where the ear goes, because of the skin draping. And so you need to know where your superficial temporal artery is. And the goal is not to ding it. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be so painful because we don't want any bipolaring or bovi. We want to try to keep it as dry. It's a disaster. Yeah, it's all. <laughs> Especially if it's an atypical placement and the artery goes under the remnant, then it's just like super stressful. So you look at where the artery is, you make the pocket. Okay. After like learning how to make your skin incisions, the next challenge is the thickness of the skin because you want it thin so that you see all of the framework and it looks nice. But if it's too thin, it all dies. Okay. So you want it thick so it has a nice blood supply. But if it's too thick, you have what I call a teddy bear ear. Mm. 
That makes sense because you can't see any of the defined cartilage under the teddy bear. And so kind of, this might sound silly comparison, is it kind of like when you're doing a Prada and you're raising your skin flat, fat up, fat down kind of thing or? Extremely similar. But what makes it challenging is you removed a remnant with cartilage in it. Okay. The microtia ear had a cartilage remnant. And after removing it, there's all these muscular fascial planes that had enveloped that ear that give you a false sense of where that plane is. Oh, okay. So how do you find the plane that you need to be in? So I like to look for it inferiorly near the mastoid, away from the remnant, because then we could do it like a parotid where it's light transilluminating. My co-surgeon or, you know, at Stanford, I have this amazing nurse practitioner, Charlie, who works with me and knows exactly how to guide me. And I move from there and then I move towards where the remnant was, where it gets challenging. That makes sense. So now any tips or tricks when you're actually putting the framework in the pocket? So we made the pocket. We made the framework. We love it. It's like a little perfect ear. We're about to go put it in. Yeah. Does it just slide in or is this like doing a no. posterior <laughs> rib or graph for the... <laughs> just, uh, is it like putting an ear tube in where it just kind of pops in, you know, one of those Armstrong grommets? No, I actually call it phase three so that mentally no one thinks that the surgery is almost over. Mm, I love that. Because it is so hard. So first you put a drain in, okay? And you put the drain in because you need that suction to create the skin coaptation. And then I call it the Cinderella moment where you remember in Cinderella when the sisters were trying to put the shoe in and they're like, I'll make it fit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you got to get, get that framework in. And then something that really always amazed me with Dr. Fermin was that she already knew where skin was going to lie even before putting the framework in. And I'm trying to get a sense of that now. And I think I'm getting much better with, you know, more experience. And so once you put the framework in and you have that lobule translocated, there's always excess skin. Knowing where to safely cut the skin is the battle. And that battle can take hours because you don't want to lose your anterior blood supply. That's the most robust blood supply, which comes from that superficial temporal artery. But your remnants from that microtic ear is what makes the ear ugly, which I call the nubbin. The more nubbins you have, the uglier the ear is. And so I thought a lot about this when I look at our previous dehiscences and our previous wins and losses. And what I've learned is it's better to delay removal of nubbins for safety of the flap and then deal with it at the next surgery. That makes sense. Yeah. And what size drains do you use? Seven. Are these like the JP? <laughs> no, it's like facelift drains. Okay. Yeah. I think the 10 French. And are these? Round. Okay. Two of them? One of them? We used to do two, but I've learned that you can get away with one and most my crochet surgeons use one. Okay. And is it just to like a bulb suction? I've seen it attached to like a test tube before. So test tubes are great because it's like a little amount of suction. So the amount of suction in the test tube so it's like a 5cc, right? 5cc test tube gives you that amount of suction, but it has to be changed every four hours. And that is the classic Burt Brent technique. Um, but it was very labor intensive for the nurses and quite stress inducing because they have to stab the test tubes. Yeah. Yeah. And they get clogged. I remember them getting clogged. You're kind of, what is it called? Um, trying to milk it a little bit to get the clot out. And so we switched to a Constavac. What is that? I'm embarrassed because it's like, it's so fancy. <laughs> it, it's Stanford, girl. <laughs> Y'all can um, do that. We're fancy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's this box-based drain that has a lower amount of suction than your wall suction. And so it's really nice because it allows you to turn the suction up, turn it down, and have like this almost equivalent to your 5cc test tube amount of suction, but you never lose it because it's based on a battery. So it's nice. And that stays in for how long? But by the way, a JP bulb is probably fine. And, and many surgeons use just a JP bulb and it works great because that bulb in itself isn't that much suction either. And it stays in this part I just do because I did what Dr. Fermin did. You know what I mean? So for about three days. So are your kids in the hospital for all three? Mm-hmm. 
They are, okay. And that is the disadvantage of a cartilage technique. I don't always see it as disadvantageous because... It's got to hurt. I mean, the rib graft part, right? It's got to hurt. Um, I like being able to take care of the kids and supporting the families and giving them pain medicine so that by the time they go home, that rib pain is mostly resolved. And also to help take care of the ear. Um, I think it's hard to go home right after a big surgery. And then I kind of jumped ahead with the drains, but um, in terms of suture for your closure, what do you like to use when you're closing the, the skin? You know, every surgeon does this differently. Are you tacking anything down? Do you have any quill type tackings and how does that work? Okay, so let's talk about the closure first. Because we're always taught for layer closure, right? Two layer closure, a dermal layer and a subcutaneous layer. But I always say that my crochet is different because we are stretching the skin over something without a blood supply, over a block of an inert object, you know? And so I don't want anything that compromises blood flow. And I was amazed to see that Dr. Fermin closed the wound in, in a single layer closure. And that's with a 5 or a 6 ethylon. And that is not a perfectly subcutaneous. It's like this kind of in-between thickness. That's what I've learned. It's like a little bit into the dermis. It's light. It's not a tight closure. And there are no deep dermals that will kind of strangulate. That skin is so thin. I don't know if you've ever closed like a preregular pit. Like that skin is really thin. You know what I mean? Like I love Dermabond for those, but you can't put, Dermabond is not going to work for this closure. So single layer monofilament, that's my optimal closure. It's very Nagata to have these little bolsters that you bolster into place. I'm not brave enough yet. <laughs> And that's sort of tacking just the skin down or actually tacking like zero form down, like using something to bolster. And for me, would do this too, like roll up little tiny zero forms, tuck them into corners and then secure them down so that the skin will co op that way. I'd rather just get it with suction and then not do anything more traumatic to the skin. Do you do like um, mastoid dressing or fluff and one of those mastoid bands? Or do you leave the ear open to air? What kind of dressing do you use? All right. So there are two worlds, glass cock or no glass cock. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes. Ear cup, ear McMuffin, whatever you want to call it, or none. And so when I first joined K. Chang, he was using the glass cock. Um, and I think that's what a lot of surgeons use. And what I learned was that it moves and for kids with hemifacial microsomia, it's not perfect. Like it's all over their eye. And, and then finally, we had a patient that like slept on their ear with the glass cock putting pressure on it. And there was a wound. And so I talked to Dr. Fermin about it. And she was like, why don't you use my dressing? <laughs> and so we switched. And her dressing has a name at Stanford. And I call it death by white tape because it's, it's a little silly. But it's basically bacitracin. Vaseline gauze strips cut to cover the ear and the incisions, and then fluffs, and then white tape taping those fluffs into a square around the ear. Like uh, silk tape, paper tape, that kind of stuff? It's paper tape, one inch paper tape. And it's so much paper tape, watching you place it is like absurd. You think she's insane. <laughs> You're like, there's no, she can't possibly put more tape on. And like, she's, it, it, it. Oh, that's um, so funny. And it's just enough pressure without a lot of pressure. Yeah. And then if it comes off, you can always retape it. It never comes off. It's mastisol down. Oh. And how long does that stay on for? For the three days. So the classic for mean thing would be to pour the mastisol into the cup and she'd have everybody sniff it in the room. Because <laughs> you know the smell of mastisol. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, and then you paint, you paint the area. Actually, you know, I always feel like it's a very French dressing to cover the ear. It's like efficient, has a lot of red tape, but like perfect. Exactly. Oh, goodness. So, and then afterwards, uh, antibiotics? I do. I give antibiotics. While they're in the hospital, home, what's your protocol? So, you know, it's really hard to have evidence-based medicine for antibiotics for this case. And I've had a lot of meetings with infectious disease about it because we want to be evidence-based. But my argument is, is that you have cartilage, you know, as a donor in a wound that is by hair. And then especially if there's an ear canal, if the child has an ear canal, there's a couple of things that I do ahead of time, but they are on antibiotics until they go home while there's a drain in. 
Okay. So then when they drains out, they're ready to go home. They're not on another four days or something like that. They, ha- they do have a couple more days just to complete a week's course. Okay. Okay. And are you just doing Keflex if no penicillin sensitivity? I, I don't like Keflex because um, it's four times a day and I think it's it's hard on families. So I do Augmentin. I feel bad that my infectious disease colleagues, they're so good. And I know, here's one thing. When we operate near hair and near ear canals, it's hard to obtain the same sterility as like just skin. We are not scrubbing those ear canals. Do you know what I mean? So my my rule with kids with ear canals are, one, they always get their ears cleaned before surgery. So we clean them at pre-op. And then they always get like a couple drops of floxin because nothing will destroy your framework more than pseudomonas. And um, last thing is sometimes the little microtia ears have little pits in them, you know, those little pits. And those have debris and bacteria in them that can't be sterilized. Do you take those pits out at the time of the repair? If I think it's going to compromise the skin flap, I try to leave them. If it's full of debris, then I take them out. Okay. Yeah. I didn't even think about the pits mm-hmm. and how that might play a role. Um, yeah, it's but... the pits. Yeah. <laughs> All right. As we round this uh, out, I know we kind of stayed with grade one surgery with rib graft. Do you get a chest x-ray afterwards? In that we do. Post-op? Okay. Mm-hmm. And then what other final pearls, tips, or tricks uh, do you want to leave our audience with? Because we're just coming around that time. People who are obsessed with microtia surgery, like you're obsessed. And I think of the surgery in pockets of everything is hard with microtia. So Just finishing the surgery is like a win. Like I finished. But once you get to that stage, you want to make sure your skin pocket and your framework are excellent. Those take two different skills. And so practice carving, okay, and look at different models and really challenge yourself that your framework is nice. And then once you get that, think about different skin approaches for your skin pocket. Both battles are equally important to have a good looking ear. Thank you so much, Mighty. I learned so much. Um, I love picking your brain about this. For our listeners that might want to get more information about you or your technique, I know the Stanford website has a a lot of information. Y'all have done an excellent job discussing your program. Are you on any social media or anything like that? Yes, I have an Instagram, Dr. Trong Microtia. I have an atlas that has all my drawings from my time with Dr. Fermin. So if you look up the Stanford Atlas, it's a step-by-step for her technique with wonderful drawings. And then finally, I invite all my crochet surgeons to come visit. I think that it's a hard surgery and we shouldn't all learn it all on our own. And just like Dr. Fermin had visiting surgeons every week, I think we should collaborate. So come visit. I can talk about my crochet for hours. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mai Tu. It was a pleasure to get to hang out and talk to you and geek out with you on this topic. For our listeners, thank you for stopping by. I think it's a wrap. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's Version Hess and Yvonne Ogrodzinski. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Thanks again for listening and see you next week.